how do I start this tonight? There's not going to be a this week, not going to be a theme, none of that stuff. We have too much to go over. And me and everyone else in the wrestling community are pissed off at WWE and Vince McMahon for what he did on Monday Night Raw. What he did on Monday Night Raw was try and be the biggest asshole in WWE, trying to prove Triple H wrong. This is how petty Vince McMahon is. The fact that NXT is the hottest brand in all of WWE. The fact that Ricochet, Rattles to Black, Tommaso Ciampa, and Johnny Gargano are four of the top stars in all of the company. What does he do? He calls these four up on Monday Night Raw from Lafayette, Louisiana, the shithole of, Louis of Louisiana. Where these, where when, you see a, when you see pictures floating around on Monday, you see fans just arms crossed, looking uninterested, not giving a fuck. It fucking sucked sitting there watching Alistair Black make his entrance. No reaction. Ricochet come out to help uh, Ben Balor. No reaction. Johnny Gargano to Monster Chopper versus The Revival. No reaction. And before anyone thinks it was just the NXT, NXT stars getting no reaction, Triple H brought up the fact that DX is going in the Hall of Fame. Barely a reaction. The only person who seemed to get any decent reaction was Ronda Rousey coming out for her match against Ruby Riot. Vince McMahon needs to go. It was more clear and apparent this come, this past Monday on Monday Night Raw the fact that Vince McMahon had tried to sabotage, wants to sabotage his future. This is the future of your fucking company and you bring him up to a shithole like the Lafayette, Louisiana in the Cajun Dome where nobody fucking cared. You needed to promote this. You've been promoting um, Ric Flair's birthday bash for this coming Monday for weeks. But then you decide on a whim to bring these four up for no other reason than the fact that your AEW is breathing down your neck, your ratings are in the toilet, your audience is not coming to see your events because, as much because your booking is fucking shit and terrible. So what do you do? You bring four stars up and you give them, as, you give them time on screen. To no reaction because you want Triple H to be able to have his heart broken when he when you make him realize that you think that his stars are not as over as they think they are. You fucked up so fucking badly on Monday Night Raw. You try to do it again on SmackDown Live, but the thing of it is, people knew that these guys were probably going to be on SmackDown too, and New Orleans, Louisiana, where all four of these guys were in excellent matches last year. Ricochet was in the, the Fatal Four, that six, that six man ladder match. Alistair Black was winning the NXT Championship, and Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa were killing each other in an unsation match in this very arena. The crowd was more receptive, the crowd was more lively, the crowd wanted to fucking be there. Lafayette, Louisiana did not deserve the um, debuts of those four guys. Lafayette, Louisiana, Zana did not deserve anything when it came to these guys. I don't want WWE to ever book a Raw, SmackDown, or a pay-per-view or anything in Lafayette, Louisiana. Those fuckers can go to hell. Those fuckers are pieces of shit who should shut the fuck up. And I saw people on, tw on Twitter after Monday Night Raw, well, oh, get this trash WWE out of Lafayette. Fuck you. Not like you have anything else going on in Lafayette right now. It was so bad. That at midnight, I'm looking on, I'm, I just uploaded my Monday Night Raw review because I still had everything working at the time. And I look on Twitter, and trending was things louder than the crowd. Hashtag things louder than the crowd. That's how bad it was. And then you have people coming out, oh, WWE messed with the audio, WWE messed with the um, crowd, the audience, audio, to make it seem like nobody cared. The ev evidence is right there. When you have Sasha Banks and Bailey, two of the most popular women in the division, in WWE, on this show, coming out to silence. Showing off the women's tag team championships to silence. Why would Vince McMahon sabotage two established superstars like Ronda Rousey, not Ronda, but like um, Sasha Banks and Bailey, along with the NXT stars? Why would he sabotage everyone else on this card, including a Finn Balor who didn't get any reaction? Leo Rush got no reaction. Bobby Lashley beating them, him and him and Leo Rush beating down Finn Balor before um, Ricochet came out didn't get any reaction. So why would he sabotage all of that just to get these like just to make a point? When it, it killed me 
and I'm sure everybody from Brian Zane to JD from NY206 to Call the Hall to What Culture Wrestling to everybody in the wrestling community and others that I'm not, I probably can't think of off the top of my head. It killed all of us to sit there and watch four of the most talented guys on this roster outside of the Undisputed Era who were ready to be called up get no reaction. Feel like just another, another set of hands on Monday Night Raw. That is not the way to debut somebody. That is not the way to debut anybody. I don't care who the fuck it is. That is not the way to debut them. Then you have people like, oh, they were looking for, they were look, wanting to see the Undertakers and the German Seniors, the Brock Lesnar's, the Triple B, the Rocks, and Stone Cold of the world. Get over it, fuckers. What are you expecting? Most of those guys are done and gone. What are you going to do when The Rock can't do it anymore? What are you going to do when John Cena can't do it anymore? What are you going to do when Brock Lesnar finally leaves and can't do anything? What are you going to do because The Undertaker might be gone? You need to get used to that these four guys are the fucking future of this company. And the fact that the old fucker, senile dumbass, sits there and tries everything he can to destroy these two, these four guys, credibility was just fucking pathetic. It's absolutely petty. And Vince McMahon again showed on Monday Night Raw, he has to fucking go. No excuses. And like I said last week, there was some people in WWE who said, oh, Vince McMahon was to be retired or die or whatever, that they couldn't make compelling stories or great characters. Bullshit. What Vince McMahon tried to do on Monday Night Raw was commit career suicide for these four guys. Luckily, when we got to SmackDown Live, they were sort of, they were, and, and as everyone knows, and it is a true statement, you only get, the, you, only, if you only make one, a, a first impression one time. You only get one chance at a first impression. Monday Night Raw was fucking awful. They tried again on Tuesday, that it was set the crowd. Man, like, the fact that you had Alistair Black versus Elias on Monday, then you turn it around and you bring out a old rival of his, in the same building that he beat him for the NXT Championship with his wife, with um, Alistair Black's wife by his side, mind you, which is kind of funny when you sit there and you watch Andrade versus Alistair Black and you know that Alistair Black's wife is managing his opponents. It's just kind of funny. But it just was not needed. The fact that this thing, like, anybody who sits there and wants to defend in WWE with the, the call ups and saying this was a bad idea, this was something just for WWE to do, and all. Anybody who still thinks that AEW is not a threat, AEW is not the reason this happened, the, the ratings don't fucking matter. Really? Why was Aleister Black, Tommaso Ciampa, Johnny Gargano, and Ricochet on Monday Night Raw and SmackDown Live? If ratings didn't fucking matter, if AEW was not breathing down WWE's neck, we even had somebody, I'll talk about it later, someone who asked for the release this past week. If it wasn't for those big factors right there, and the fact that the booking on Monday Night Raw has been god fucking awful since this brand split started. What, like, anybody who still thinks that AEW is not a threat to WWE, why were these four called up? If ratings didn't fucking matter, why were these four guys called up? That's the only reason that would happen. And the fact that they tried to do a night after WrestleMania, a night after SummerSlam, or a night after the Royal Rumble. Yes, I'm putting the Royal Rumble out there, too, the night after. Because this past year, especially, Phoenix brought it the night after the Royal Rumble and two nights after the Royal then the Tuesday after the Royal Rumble. So, Royal Rumble week, the, day, two, the, the two days after the Royal Rumble, the two days after WrestleMania, the two days after SummerSlam, are the days that you bring superstars up. Not the day after the Elimination Chamber, not the day after Fastlane, which I believe they're going to be in Philadelphia or Pittsburgh after the eliminate after Fastlane, which would have been a better choice anyway. This was just desperation. It reeked the desperation. You could tell it was desperation on WWE's end, and it was fucking pathetic. I don't know who, like Triple H, obviously didn't know this was going to happen, and no. To anybody who thinks, oh, Johnny Gargano dropped the, the North American Championship on Mon on two Wednesday's episode of NXT, that means he's going to be caught up and he's done. No. These episodes were taped three weeks ago. The three episodes we just saw these past three weeks were taped at the end, the beginning of February or the end of January. They were taped three weeks after, like, three weeks, yeah, the, week, the, the Wednesday after the Royal Rumble, if I'm correct. Yeah, the Wednesday after the Royal Rumble. That... There is no way, you cannot tell me that these were plans like this. 
The reason Johnny Gargano lost the North American Championship, I even expected him to lose the North American Championship, was simple. He was going to lose the title to the Velveteen Dream or whoever before we get to NXT TakeOver Brook, um, New York as they're calling it. Because it's going to be Johnny Gargano versus Tommaso Ciampa for the NXT Championship where NXT Champion Johnny Gargano will become a thing. That is all there is to it. I still want to say that striking while the iron is hot would have been Philadelphia last year for Johnny Gargano, but that's a different story for a different time. That was why that happened. Yes, and I was I was correct, and I didn't I don't read spoilers, but I was correct when I heard people were talking about there was they didn't know people who actually went they didn't know how this match was going to end because I even watched JD from New York who went to this set of tapings. He said that the championship match they had two endings taped which i kind of figured that and that's very smart for them to do but no doubt in my mind johnny gargano was going to lose the championship to free him up to take on tommaso chopper however they get there it could be this dusty road tag team classic tournament it could be whatever they want it to be the final night the final thing we're going to see in nxt takeover new york is going to be johnny gargano winning the nxt championship that is it no ifs ands or buts about it now what is going to happen with these four guys? I don't have a fucking clue. What was the fucking point, though? Other than getting ratings. Getting a rating boost. But here's the thing. In order to keep this rating boost going, do you book these four like stars? The biggest thing, and I believe what Culture Wrestling's Adam clearly brought this up in a video this week, is that WWE brought these four because of lack of stars in the mid-card. You don't say. How can anybody be booked as a fucking star? How can anyone be booked as a star in this company when you're 50-50 booking everybody? Stone Cold didn't 50-50 book with anybody. Triple H in the day didn't 50-50 book with anybody. The Undertaker, The Rock, Shawn Michaels did not 50-50 book with anybody. Those are how you build stars. You have someone come in, they win every fucking match that they're supposed to win. They do not 50-50 book. If they lose, they lose because of nefarious means. If they're a babyface, if they're a heel, they lose because of whatever. Because they walk, because they run away, or they get counted out, or they get disqualified. That is how you build stars. You don't build stars by having a Seth Rollins face off against, or Dean Ambrose face off against EC3 two weeks in a row. EC3 beat him in a fluky victory and then come back the next week and have EC3 lose in a fluky victory only for Dean Ambrose to get squashed by Drew McIntyre this past Monday. How is that building fucking stars? No. You had fucking Drew McIntyre looking like a star for weeks and weeks and months on end until you finally had him lose a fluky ass victory to, I can believe it was Finn Balor. Or, I can't remember who he lost to, but he lost to somebody, and then his momentum died because you had him lose the Finn Balor at TLC, and then so on and so forth. You had a star being built when you had Kurt Angle put Drew McIntyre over in the best possible fucking way to do it, and then you killed his momentum, and he looks like just an ordinary person. You had him team up with Bobby Lashley and, Drew and Baron Corbin, weeks on weeks on weeks on end, and... It's just, WWE, you want to make stars, you book these four guys, they do not fucking lose, period. If they don't have plans going into Fastlane, if they don't have plans going into WrestleMania, we do not need to see. We don't need to see these guys. Fastlane is in three weeks from tomorrow, or two weeks from tomorrow. You had the only match announced for Fastlane, Kofi Kingston versus Daniel Bryan. We'll get to that in a minute. But... You had these four guys take up the majority of SmackDown. And two-thirds of Monday Night Raw was these four guys. Monday Night Raw built nothing towards Fastlane. No matches announced. No nothing. You have, we're probably going to have Bobby Lashley versus Finn Balor again for the Intercontinental title. You're going to have, I don't know what else. But at least SmackDown gave you a little bit of build. And with the fact that Mandy Rose beat Asuka in one of the fluky ways that she did... That's probably going to be the women's championship match with SmackDown at Fastlane. At least SmackDown, even though even with the NXT superstars on the roster, built not too much, but a little bit towards Fastlane. Where the fuck was that on Monday Night Raw? Monday Night Raw was rematches from the night before in one way or another, and let's showcase the NXT superstars. Fuck Fastlane, it doesn't matter. No more 
We don't need to see these guys again. We don't need to see them on Monday Night Raw. And here's another thing that does it that just pisses me off. Triple Vince McMahon uh, and his writing crew do not watch NXT. Anybody who watched Raw or SmackDown and saw Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano being buddy buddy, acting like everything was kosher the entire last eight, nine, ten months, twelve, fourteen, fifteen, whatever months it was since two thousand seven, since June of two thousand seventeen, when Tommaso Ciampa turned on Johnny Gargano and beat the fuck out of him and went away for surgery. None of that ever fucking mattered. And then when someone who hasn't seen NXT on a whole is like, wow, I want to see what these guys do on NXT. I hear Johnny Gargano is going to be defending his title. They get to sm- they watch NXT. And what do you see? You see Johnny Gargano with his wife. And his wife looks over and says, what the hell are you doing here? And it's Tommaso Ciampa. And you have Johnny Gargano tell Ciampa, I won this title on my own. I don't need you. People are going to be like, like, what the fuck is going on here? When people like me... And others who watch NXT on a regular know these two are indifferent to each other. They spent the better part of last year killing each other in three big matches. And you know, you bring them up to Monday Night Raw. Let's stick them in the tag team division. Let's have them face the um, revival. Let's have them face the bar. Let's act like everything that the Triple H has built for these two and the feud that they're building towards and what's going to happen when we get into NXT TakeOver of New York, which I'm sure is going to be their best match ever because it's been a while. Let's act like none of that fucking matters. Let's pretend like they're still DIY. Oh, they were a tag team in NXT, so let's put them in the tag team division. That is just fucking stupid. And the fact that WWE goes and pulls this shit is beyond me. I don't get why WWE would do this. I don't get why anyone would fucking do this. Vince McMahon obviously does not watch his own does not watch his own product. Triple H has come out and says has said before that Vince McMahon does not has not watched a single full episode of NXT. Then why the fuck are you calling superstars up? I mean, hell, you just called six superstars up at the begin at the end, like the night after TLC. The night after TLC, you said Nikki Cross, EC3, Heavy Machinery, Lacey Evans, and Lars Sullivan were all coming to Monday Night Raw and SmackDown Live. Lars Sullivan has been a ghost. We don't know where the fuck he has been. Nikki Cross has had two matches, winning one and losing the other. Lacey Evans has performed in the Royal Rumble. You've had Heavy Machinery win. I think they had one match, a squash match that they won, and then they lost both Fatal 4-Ways. Or wasn't the victors in the Fatal 4-Way matches to see if you had a number one contenders to the Tag Team Championships. EC3 has gone 50-50 in his, in his career already. So, what the fuck? Those guys, now EC3, Nikki Cross, Lacey Evans, Heavy Machinery, and Lars Sullivan to a special extent, are not the cream of the crop. Those guys are the ones that you work from the bottom and get to the top. These four guys, Tommaso Ciampa, Alistair Black, Ricochet, and Johnny Gargano, are four of the best. They were four of the six at halftime fucking heat. These guys don't start from the bottom and go to the top. These guys are top stars from the start. This whole that, this whole notion of, oh, you were from NXT, so we got to start you at the bottom, is antiquated. It needs to go. It needs to be done. Enough of that shit. When Unspeed Era gets called up, they are the four top new guys. They are the four top guys who are going to come in. And quite honestly, when they come in, it better be an invasion angle where they just beat the hell out of everybody and take over. I'm tired of this shit. Monday Night Raw was awful. SmackDown Live made it up for it. SmackDown Live fixed what WWE's Monday Night Raw botched. It was absolutely fucking ridiculous, and I don't know who thought bringing these guys up was a good idea. Did it help in the end? For now. This was just not a great... This was just terrible. Pissed me off. Pissed off everybody else. This was not... This is Vince McMahon trying to do one and two things. Try and pop a rating and prove the Triple H that, hey... You might think these guys are top stars, but when they get to my playground, they ain't as top stars as you think they are. We're going to start them down at the very bottom, and we're going to do what everyone else. They'll be top stars. For, they'll, they'll look like top stars for now, but when WrestleMania comes around, we're going to have, after that, we're going to have them lose, 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 and then we're going to take them off TV so we don't see them anymore. Absolutely ridiculous. Vince McMahon's got to go. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Vince McMahon has got to go. It was really evident this past Monday night on Raw. And again, I don't know what else to say about that. 
but that is your opening to smack the unscripted. That was that just needed to come out. It was something that has pissed me off and has pissed other people off too. Speaking of the NXT call-ups, as we saw on Raw and SmackDown, the audience were exposed to some of the most talented stars NXT has to offer. When Ricochet, Alistair Black, NXT North, uh, Johnny Gargano, and Tommaso Ciampa made their main roster debuts. On the latest edition of Wrestling Observer Radio, this was right after Monday Night right Raw, I'm pretty sure Dave Meltzer explained that WWE has ha- had a different episode of Raw put together sometime last week. One that didn't include any new call-ups. A week of ratings continuing to decline, all of the wrestling continuing to gain momentum, and the announcement that Undertaker is joining StarCast 2 on Double or Nothing weekend left McMahon feeling off. McMahon decided to add some top tier wrestlers to the main roster, so he accessed the pool of available NXT stars and asked them to fly out to their best four guys. Melson notes that Triple H did not know initially about the call ups, and there was lack of communication throughout the process. The Raw match that ultimately saw Bobby Lashley and Leo Rush versus the um, Finn Balor and Ricochet was reportedly set to be Finn Balor versus Ricochet in a singles match. Just before the show aired, it was believed that Triple H made the call to switch it up to the single match between the two babyface characters because he was concerned about how the crowd would react. Well, if you watch Monday Night Raw, the crowd didn't give two shits about anything. And he didn't want either star going over the other after Balor had just won the title and Ricochet had just debuted. You could have made this really simple. You could have had the one-on-one match, which, by the way, Lafayette did not deserve, you piece of fucking shits. But you could have had the one-on-one match, and neither one goes over because you could have had Leo Rush walk out and say, some, say something to the fact that he did, where he's like, you don't deserve to be champion, this match needs to stop, and then Bobby Lashley comes out and destroys both men. Then, it was also noted that the foreseeable future Ricochet, Black, Gargano, and Ciampa will be performing on NXT, Raw, and SmackDown. The idea is to give each superstar their respective push, push and be put over like crazy in the process. It will be interesting to see just how this translates to NXT's takeover special at WrestleMania weekend. It was mentioned that NXT had already had storylines on card laid out for the upcoming takeover event, but the sudden change of plans may alter that. From what I'm hearing, I don't think it's really altered much. I'm not saying I, I'm I'm not saying that I know what happens, but I've heard that Alistair Black. Ricochet, Darmaso Ciampa, and Johnny Gargano were heavily used on this kind of, this set of tapings, which were taped this past Wednesday. So everything, I think Triple H is like, you know what? They might be on the main roster, but fuck it. I'm going through with what I have played out, planned out. We deserve, us as fans, we deserve to see an end to Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa's storyline that has been going on for two years almost, for a year and six months or so. Since June of 2017, this storyline has been building has been like um, uh, maturing and mar- marinating. We need the finished product. We need the storybook ending to this fairy tale, this show. This needs to end at TakeOver with Johnny Gargano winning the NXT Championship. Plain and simple. Now, because the four men were brought up to NXT, I don't have this in the news, but I do remember this. Ricochet, who was supposed to wrestle at a couple of Evolve events, was pulled from those due to him going up to the main roster. So this is he's on his way to being a permanent member to the main roster. The Velveteen Dream is taking his place. Backstage reaction to this week's NXT call-ups. Four NXT stars made their debut. We know that. We had to pass you away with the backstage reaction to these new call-ups. This comes from Mike Johnson for the PW Insider. He is a quote via the WrestlingNews.co. Four stars that were brought up. They were not at the elimination table. I can tell you from speaking to a number of people who work on the main roster. No one to seem to have any knowledge or understanding that they were coming to work the show. When they showed up, there was definitely some side eyes at these guys going, okay, why are they all here? Why are they all working raw? There were definitely some talents who have been brought up within the last couple of months who were really, who really have just kind of floated around, not due to their issues, but just because due to how they were being treated on creative. They were kind of like, oh, are you coming for my spot? What's going on here? For the first time in a while, not that there was anger or resentment against the quartet that showed up on Monday Night Raw, but we definitely heard some feedback from some WWE talents who were paying closer attention to their own spot and what these talents coming up could mean for their spot. I don't mean people who just come up to the roster from NXT. I'm talking about existing mid-card talent who haven't gotten a lot or just starting to get a little bit of a push again. There was definitely some whispering among each other like, hey, what's going on here? As we noted prior, WWE writers were told to think outside the box for the episode this week. It looks like they did just that. Of course, um, EC3, Lacey Evans, Heavy Machinery, Nikki Cross, 
Of course, those guys and girls are going to sit there and be like, what's going on here? We just got caught up. What the hell? We just got caught up two months ago, and now you're bringing somebody else up? What's that going to do for my push? What's that going to do for me on this roster, on these main rosters? It's like, are you fucking for real? This is pathetic. Again, leaps of desperation. You brought up in December, you brought up the mid-card talent, and now you bring up the main event talent. And the main event talent is going to get precedent over the mid-card talent that you brought up from NXT. So EC3 probably won't be seen for a while again. He's a ghost. He wasn't on Raw or SmackDown this week. Lacey Evans is only getting her walk down the aisle, go do a little wave and walk back treatment right now. We'll talk about that in a minute. Nikki Cross, she's a ghost. She hasn't been seen anywhere. And Heavy Machinery have been just used as comedy fodder. Lars Sullivan's still not around. Who knows when he's coming back, if ever. Smack, and, and, I would, and of course, like an Apollo Clues, like um, a Zack Ryder, Kurt Hawkins, who were in a squash match where they lost to Lucha House Party. Those guys are going to be like, wait a minute, we just started getting something, and now you're going to have these guys come up? That's going to kill whatever we had going. It's a doggy dog world in WWE, and the new, the new blood of these four guys is going to hurt those people who are already there. You just brought up so many people last year from Andrade to AOP to the Sanities that you're hardly even using as it is. So slow it down. You don't need to bring everyone up. Quite honestly, WWE has so much talent that they wouldn't need to pull, bring up anybody else for about a year. Unless you started releasing people, which we know they're not going to want to do that. Just so much that WWE has got to get right and they're failing in everything. SmackDown fixed whatever WWE, what Monday Night Raw did wrong, and then some. How did the ratings for Raw and SmackDown do with the shows on, with the NXT stars on the shows? WWE Monday Night Raw on President's Day featured follow-up from an elimination trailer with top NXT stars and Action Plus Raw Women's Champion Ruby Riot, I mean, Ronda Rousey versus Ruby Riot in a main event drew 22.771 million viewers. This was up 12.6% from last week's 2.462 million viewers from the Chamber Go Home episode. And the best viewership of 2019. This is also the best viewership going back all the way to September 3rd of last year, which drew 2.872 million. And after that Labor Day show, it just started going downhill. For this week's show, first hour drew a 3.046, which is up majorly from last week's 2.689. The second hour drew a 2.840, which was up significantly from the 2.445. And the final hour drew a 2.427, which is up, of course, from last week's 2.252. A 20% drop from the first hour, which is expected because, honestly, Monday Night Raw still needs to go back to two hours. It's kind of funny that you still, like, watching everything from the XFL, which is coming out next year for, Debbie, for Vince McMahon and Oliver Luck and them. And they talk, they just talked about Pep, William, um, Pep Hamilton, who is going to be the DC coach. And in that little mini press conference, they talked about how they want to get this thing down to under three hours. And it's like, you keep hearing that, but then you have Vince McMahon who allows his Monday Night Raw to be three hours long. And the only reason that SmackDown loses to Monday Night Raw every week in the ratings for the most part is because Raw has that third hour to make their number higher. I guarantee you, if you took Raw from most weeks, not this week, but for most weeks, and put it only the first two hours against SmackDown's first two hours, like two hours... I guarantee you Raw's losing those rating battles most of the time. Raw was number 5 in viewership on the cables. How did SmackDown do? SmackDown drew 2.269 million viewers, up 11.6 from last week's 2.034. This is also the highest rating for 2019, for the highest since November 13th episode, which added a 2.312 million viewers. So, for the most part, for the first week of bringing them up, it did work, help the ratings. To anybody still who thinks that ratings do not matter, really, you still, after this week, want to think ratings don't matter. The ratings don't matter. It's all about how much money they make. So why are Ricochet, Johnny Gargano, Tommaso Ciampa, and Alistair Black on Monday Night Raw and SmackDown Live? Can someone explain, explain that one to me? Can someone explain to me why four of the top NXT stars are on the main roster if ratings don't don't matter. Anybody, anybody after this week has anything to say about ratings don't matter. You need to shut the fuck up and just keep it to yourself because you're full of shit. Then Monday Night Raw and SmackDown Live desperately bringing those four guys up tells you 
that ratings matter. Ratings is going to matter for SmackDown in October because they got to get into the threes if they don't want SmackDown to get canceled within an hour, within a month or two. SmackDown needs to get their ratings up or they're going to be out of luck very, very soon. Kofi Kingston will, of course, be facing WWE Champion Daniel Bryan at Fastlane. This is a change as Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Observer Radio ta- said that Kofi was not the choice for Bryan's next challenger. As of Monday morning, WWE has confirmed that Bryan's opponent for Fastlane will be announced on SmackDown, as was Kofi Kingston. In an update, Meltzer reports that the change of plans took place on Monday afternoon, and Kingston is now going to face Daniel Bryan. Based on Kofi's performance in last Tuesday's gauntlet match and his performance in the Elimination Chamber, the decision was made to change plans and go with Kofi versus Bryan at Fastlane. As noted before, the Q in Cleveland had been advertising a WWE Triple Threat match for the March 10th, March 10th Fastlane pay-per-view, with Ryan defending against AJ Styles and Samoa Joe. There's no word yet what Joe and Styles will be doing for Fastlane. There's also no word yet on Kingston vs. Ryan will affect plans for the WWE title match at WrestleMania 35. As noted, word is that <clears throat> Ryan will be defending his title against a superstar. We'll talk about that in a minute. Returning or being brought back for the biggest show of the year instead of a regular member of the Blue Band roster. I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, with all of this, I would love to know, I would love to know the thought coming through Mustafa Ali's head right now in his heart. This guy's got to be heartbroken. This was, this was, Kofi Kingston was never supposed to be in this whatsoever. Kofi Kingston was never supposed to be a part of this at all. Kofi Kingston is a comedy act. Kofi Kingston is a t- comedy tag team act with Big E and Xavier Woods. The only reason he's in this spot is because of an injury that took Mustafa Ali out. Mustafa Ali was supposed to get this big push. Mustafa Ali was supposed to be in this spot. And it sucks that a guy who is... This could be... And with Vince McMahon, the way he changes his mind all the time, this could have been the one and only shot that Mustafa Ali gets at the big time. Kofi Kingston was supposed to have this type of run in 2009, 2010... When Randy Orton bitched a fake allegedly backstage and, derail, and derailed him to where he became nothing but a mid-carder. To everybody who is on Kofi Kingston bandwagon, where were you for the last 11 years? Where were you since the New Day's been around? Where were you for Kofi then? Why weren't you chanting for Kofi? Give Kofi a chance. Why is everyone like, what's with hashtag Kofi Mania now? Because, and it's not going to happen. I'm sorry. To anybody who thinks Kofi Kingston is winning the WWE Championship, it's not going to happen. It's not. WWE, as we all know, does not ever strike while the iron is hot. The iron for Kofi Kingston was hot at the Elimination Chamber. They had any chance they could have... The referee has a little earpiece in his ear. They could have called an audible immediately. Immediately. Had the ref talk to, like, talk to Daniel Bryan, like, we're, gonna, we're changing the plans... Kofi's going to hit, and tell Kofi and him what's going to happen. Like, tell Kofi and Daniel Brown what's going to happen as the ref checks on them. That's how, you know, changes happen. And they could have went and gave Kofi the championship. He could hold it till fast lane, and Daniel Brown beats him at fast lane. But they didn't. They stayed with the plan of Daniel Brown retaining. Even if Mustafa Ali was in this match, I didn't think he was going to win the WWE Championship at the Elimination Chamber. Nobody was walking out of that title but Daniel Bryan. It's just another case of WWE not striking while it was hot. Look at T, um, Clash of Champions, I believe it was, 2017. Clash of Champions 2017, where it was the blue brand. This was back when we still had single branded pay-per-views. It was a fatal four-way, if I'm correct. The Rusev Day versus the New Day versus the Usos, and I cannot remember the fourth team because the bar was still on Raw. Was it the Colones? Was it... I can't remember who it was, but you had four teams. And Rusev Day... Every time they came so close to the blue, the crowd was so hot for Rusev Day on that match. You had the stack lane on Kofi Kingston and I believe um, one of the Usos. I can't be- I, I believe I could be wrong, but two guys were in the stack lane and the crowd wanted to tap out so goddamn badly. The fans that night so goddamn badly wanted Rusev Day to win this match, win that match, and it didn't happen. Go back and listen to, I believe it was Brian, um, Brian Alvarez and, um, and Dave Meltzer talk about that match right after that show. He, you could tell they even agreed that they that people wanted them to win that match. They were so hot for Rusev Day. That was the hardest Rusev Day had ever been. And it didn't happen. 
and slowly the roots of the hair gimmick just started to slowly decline and decline and decline to where it's gone and it's no longer a thing. NXT is not a is not um, safe from this either. We'll look at NXT Takeover Philadelphia just a month later. NXT Takeover Philadelphia. Johnny Gargano was the hottest he had ever been, and still to this day, the hottest he had ever been in the company. Crowd wanted him to topple Almas. Crowd wanted him to topple Almas and win the NXT Championship and be raising that title up only for um, out for Tommaso Ciampa to strike him in the back. And it didn't happen. Very rarely does WWE ever strike while the iron is hot. That was the situation this past Sunday. Last Sunday on uh, the Elimination Chamber. That was the situation. And WWE, quick, clearly, you could hear the crowd chanting for Kofi, Kofi. The crowd wanted it. And it didn't happen. If it didn't happen then, it's not going to happen in the Elimination Chamber. And that is definitely what's going to happen. Daniel Bryan will keep the title. And there's no way that you're going to give Daniel Bryan that hemp title. Taking it off of him before WrestleMania. It's just not going to happen. I'm sorry. It's just not. The biggest question I have for everybody. If Mustafa Ali had his position like he was supposed to be. Where would you all be? Would you all be like, oh, he like? Would you be on his side? Would you be saying Ali Mania, as Mustafa like Mustafa Ali Mania? Would you all be wanting, chanting for his name in the Elimination Chamber? Would you want him to have the championship match at Fastlane? Would you have done anything to get this guy over, or would you just be like everybody else, every hypocrite out there who sit there and be like, oh, he's two or five live? When Mustafa Ali beat Daniel Bryan in that tag team match with Dan with AJ Styles. Do you know how many fucking people were criticizing WWE for having the WWE champion get beat by somebody from 205 Live who just came over from 205 Live, how it made the WWE champion look weak? Like, the stupidity of these people. It's called getting somebody fresh and somebody new and pushing them to become a star in the company. Gee, everyone's sick and tired of seeing the same old man or the same old guys in the main event spot. When WWE starts to push somebody else like Mustafa Ali was at the beginning of the year, you people shit all over it. The fact that WWE was giving this guy a push, only to have an injury taken and derail him. And again, it's got to be heartbreaking for Mustafa Ali. Because it's happened before. Finn Balor won the Universal Championship on his first pay-per-view. He is the first person, and Michael Cole put this out there, at SummerSlam 2016, he is the first person to come, like, to make his pay-per-view debut and win a world championship in WWE history. He was supposed to hold that title up until I don't know when, but they were going to have him hold that title and be the face of Monday Night Raw until, of course, Roman Reigns was out over his over was out of the doghouse. And what happened? He got injured and never recovered. Yes, he's the Intercontinental Title Champion now. But the only reason he's in a Continental Champion is because they want him to be happy. Because if Finn Balor's not happy, Finn Balor's going to want to leave. And Finn Balor will no longer exist because Prince Devitt will be in All Elite Wrestling or back in New Japan. So, that's why he's in a Continental Champion. But for two years, WWE did not give shit about him. 2017 TLC, we got treated to an AJ Styles versus Finn Balor match on the fucking fly. Could you imagine what those two would have had if they could have had proper time to build for a match? Which is why I think one should go to Smack. Like I think Finn Balor should go to SmackDown after WrestleMania. AJ Styles stay on SmackDown. And we get a feud between those two, a proper feud. But the next night, what happened? Finn Balor went up against Kane, and Kane squashed him in like two minutes. So, yeah, Finn Balor was the man on WWE on Monday Night Raw for 22 hours. And then went away, came back, and was never the same. Mustafa Ali, it's got to suck because sometimes most guys only get one chance. And it feels like Mustafa Ali's chance was there and the ch his chance is now gone. And Kofi Kingston's in that place. He locked in to his pot. They could have put anybody in there. They could have put Andrade. They could have put, they could have put Killian Dane. They could have put Rey Mysterio. They could have put R-Truth. They could have put Rusev, Nakamura. Anybody. 
they went with Kofi Kingston. And now Kofi Kingston gets a spot that he should have had 10 years ago. We'll see what happens, but as of right now, I don't see Russo, I don't see Kofi Kingston winning the WWE Championship, nor should he. Then, like, I'm sorry, but I have no problem with Kofi Kingston. If he wins the championship, I'm not going to be like, oh, it shouldn't have happened, blah, blah, blah. No, if Kofi Kingston wins the championship, good, good on him. It should have happened a long time ago. But I'm not going to hold my breath if he doesn't. It's not a problem. Uh, the mania plans for Daniel Bryan are as follows. Apparently, the new number one contender for Brandon's Prime will be turning on SmackDown as it was Kofi Kingston. Inside, inside Monster is under the impression that we will be bringing back a recognizable star to face Daniel Bryan and hopefully get more viewers tuning into SmackDown. The potential stars that are reportedly in discussion to face Daniel Bryan next at WrestleMania are Bray Wyatt, Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, Kurt Angle, John Cena, Dave Batista, and The Undertaker. Batista, John Cena, Undertaker, and Kurt Angle, no. We'll talk about what Kurt Angle is probably going to be doing at WrestleMania. Ray Wyatt, no. Sami Zayn, no. Kevin Owens, no. Why the hell would you want to see any of these guys? It was noted that Sami Zayn is ready to return to action. He also added that Batista was not interested in signing with AEW, but had, WWE had no deal with him as of a week ago. Cena is not likely, as there were probably other plans for him at the event. The, the included mention of The Undertaker is rather surprising, especially considering his recent decision to take bookings and appearances outside of WWE. Taker will even be appearing at Starcats 2 on Double or Nothing Weekend this upcoming May. Talks with Taker for a WrestleMania match started, started again this past weekend. The previous report claiming that WWE didn't originally have the plan for The Undertaker at this year's WrestleMania or the next Saudi shows. It would be interesting to see if a match with Brian is how they utilize the female mania. Now, why would you want to have The Undertaker versus Daniel Bryan for the WWE Championship? That would be stupid. That would be absolutely stupid. Do you really expect WWE to have Daniel Bryan beat The Undertaker at WrestleMania? No. Do you really expect to see The Undertaker have a WrestleMania appearance and win the WWE Championship at 50, what is it, 53 years old? Undertaker should have ended his career two years ago at WrestleMania 33 when he took his hat off, took his gloves off, took his um, coat off, and left him in the ring. The fact that you had him come back for a two-minute squash and then wrestle at the Greatest Royal Rumble, wrestle at Super Showdown, and wrestle at um, Crown Jewel in some of the worst matches in Undertaker's storied career, you're just taking the Undertaker character itself and diminishing everything that was special about it. I don't want to remember the Undertaker as a feeble, um, senile, and like hardly like looks like shit wrestler. You want to remember the Undertaker from the Attitude Era. From the Ruthless Aggression era, from the um, whatever the era after that was, you want to know, you want to see the Undertaker up until he faced at the end of the era match. That is the like, like pretty much the last time that you want to really see the Undertaker. Maybe CM Punk. That wasn't a bad match. Everything up like, the, like from when the streak started to when the streak like right before the streak ended is where you want to see the Undertaker. I don't even want to remember him from the streak ending because that match was terrible. This is not the way we want to see The Undertaker, and I don't want to see The Undertaker wrestle again. Keep it out of there. It did come out, and I believe Pro Wrestling Unlimited CUT page broke this versus that it looks like it's going to be Kevin Owens coming back to face Daniel Bryan. Why the fuck would you have Kevin Owens come back to face Daniel Bryan? My opinion, Kevin Owens, who looks like he's going to be a babyface now, it only makes sense for him to come back to face Bobby Lashley. Bobby Lashley... And if you want Sami Zayn to come back, you can do a tag team match. Bobby Lashley and Leo Rush versus Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. Because Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens were both, in storyline, taken out of rest, uh, out by, by um, Bobby Lashley. So it would only make sense to have two guys who were taken out by Bobby Lashley to come back to beat him and his little friend and move on from there. That should be the match for Bobby, for Kevin Owens, and if Sami Zayn comes back as well. Which, after Kofi Kingston and Daniel Bryan at the Elimination Chamber, Sami Zayn, who had come out and saying that he hasn't really wanted to come back because he hasn't had the feeling to come back. Him watching Daniel Bryan and Kofi Kingston, it makes it seem like he's actually more ready to come back than he was before Sunday. Speaking of The Undertaker at Starcast, Vince McMahon is said to be very upset about this. The Undertaker signed a deal and is scheduled to appear at StarCast 2's wrestling convention in Las Vegas on Saturday, May 20th. The convention follows on the same date as All Elite Wrestling's Double Nothing event. 
and the two are affiliated with one another, but StarCast is not considered to be an official AEW event. It is not. The news about Taker appearing at the StarCast was apparently a big deal to WWE CEO Vince McMahon, and it did not go down well with him. According to Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Missouri Radio, he notes that Vince McMahon is under the depression that StarCast and All Elite Wrestling are directly related to one another, and he's not happy with the developing situation. Just days before it was officially announced, AEW announcer and founder of StarCast, Conrad Thompson, gave Wrestling Inc. a hint about Undertaker's appearance in StarCast. He said, with a few exceptions, I got everybody I wanted, Thompson said. There will be a lot of star power at StarCast 2, and I started with, hey, let me make a list of everybody that wasn't available for the first one for whatever reason, and let me try to book those guys. I was successful in doing so, Hypo- hypothetically, if Undertaker was, was at StarCast, that would be a pretty big deal, huh? Thompson did reiterate that AEW and StarCast are separate entities. It was a thrill as a wrestling fan to be a part of something so historic at the Valley. Thompson said, no, I do not work there for AEW. And there's a lot of people saying, oh, StarCast is an AEW event. No, we are featuring a ton of AEW talent, but StarCast is owned by me and it's an independent thing. There will be a ton of wrestlers from other companies there. It's the exact same as the first StarCast. It's sort of an official, unofficial, if that makes any sense. Meltzer also mentioned that there are still no definite plans for the Undertaker at WrestleMania. A large portion of the WrestleMania card is still in flux and has yet to be established. Even John Cena is reported to not have any determined opponent for this year's show of shows. StarCast 2 will be taking place in Los Angeles, Las Vegas for the May 23rd through 26th, and tickets are now available. To anybody who's going to see The Undertaker, he is a secondary attraction. Like, if you buy tickets to go to StarCast, that does not mean you get to go meet and greet with The Undertaker. You have to pay extra. I believe they're going to have like a gold wristband or something for you to wear. But that is that. Vince McMahon has just got to get over himself and realize that The Undertaker is probably not going to be wrestling much longer, if ever at all. And quite honestly, if this keeps Undertaker out of WrestleMania, then I'm fine. I'm fine with it. Undertaker wants to go make his two hundred and fifty, like 25000 or 50000 or 75000 whatever the deal is. Then go make his money. I hope he, I hope if anybody gets to go meet the Undertaker, they have fun. Starcast look two seems like it's going to be a lot of fun. Update on Oscar's Mania plans. Yes, yes, they do have plans at this time for Oscar at, Sma- at WrestleMania. Shocking, I know. There has been talk of doing Lacey Evans versus Women's Champion Oscar at WrestleMania 35, according to Dave Meltzer. Evans vs. Oscar was definitely on the books at one point, but the impression has been given that the match is being reconsidered. It's not 100% that the match won't be happening, but it's not a lock at one, as it once was penciled in. Pretty much, even if it's written in pen, it could be written in blood on the WrestleMania card, and it could still be changed at the last minute. Go see WrestleMania 31, where the, mat, the finish was supposed to be Roman Reigns beating, beating the um, Brock Lesnar for the WWE Championship. That was probably written in Vince McMahon's blood, and by the time the show was over, Seth Rollins was cashing in, which was done halfway through the show. Evans made a brief appearance at the Elimination Chamber on Sunday, and the another brief appearance at last when last night's Raw, um, at Raw and on SmackDown. She did distract Oscar in her match. Then the first step in a big plans for a super big push for Evans. The idea behind the brief walkout on the stage was to further expose Evans to the fans and to acknowledge that she is an important part of the women's division to watch. There's no word yet on what they might be have planned for Evans if they decide against the match with Oscar. Um, Evans, give her a couple matches in at least. Don't just have her like, oh, I don't want a Fandango um, thing where we have her come out and walk down the ring, walk up, and then eventually she gets a match and she doesn't wrestle a first singles match until WrestleMania and then walks out women's champion. I think that would be fucking stupid. She's an, she's an okay wrestler. She's not really one of the best out there. I mean, the one thing that she does, and I will say this again, Charlotte Flair should be taking taking notes from Lacey Evans on how to do a fucking moonsault because Lacey Evans does it better than, Ron, than Charlotte Flair. I'm just saying. Oscar versus Lacey Evans, I'd have to warm up to the idea, but for now, I'd rather see Nikki Cross versus Oscar at WrestleMania, and I think that would be a much better match. You could talk. You could show highlights of the feud in NXT if you wanted to, because you're more acknowledging NXT now than you ever have before. So that would definitely, I think, be a much better WrestleMania match. But we'll have to wait and see. The big dog Roman Reigns will be on Raw this Monday. 
We'll soon get a Roman Reigns leukemia update from the man himself. Vince McMahon announced on his official Twitter account and that Reigns will return to Monday Night Raw next week to address the status of his fight with leukemia. He then called Reigns a classy fighter and that he is proud of him. Vince said, and I quote, Roman at WWE Roman Reigns, a.k.a. AKA Joe Onowale. Onowale, I can't say it right, I'm sorry. Will address the status of his fight with leukemia this Monday. Hashtag fighter, hashtag pal, hashtag classy. By 4.52, p.m. on February 23rd. <coughs> Yeah. Sorry. While his future currently unknown, <coughs> the uh, Roman Reigns update should make things clearer going forward. This thing goes one or two ways. Either A, he's back, he'll be back in time for WrestleMania, or B, formal retirement. Plain and simple. You're not going to have Roman Reigns come in and give us an update on his um, condition unless there is something going on on in which he would be back or he would have to formally retire. There was a lot of speculation that he is, I guess, booked for Good Morning America, and that is going to lead in him coming to Monday Night Raw and formally announcing his retirement from WWE and from wrestling. Jeez, I'm sorry, but if that was to happen, I'm sure Vince McMahon would probably have a heart attack. I think Vince McMahon would have a heart attack if he found out that um, Roman Reigns had to retire and could no longer come back. I'm going to say right now, I hope that's not the case. I don't want to see anyone have to have their career cut short for any reason other than they want to retire on their own. This would not be somebody who want to retire on their own if that is what happens. So it's either one or two ways. He's retiring or he'll be back in time for WrestleMania. And somehow, some way, he is going to be facing Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania for the Universal Championship instead of Seth Rollins. That's all there is to it. And again, we'll have to wait again. Because he might get a babyface reaction on Monday Night Raw, but when everyone starts to be, if he does, if it's like he's back, he'll be hated in within two weeks. I guarantee it. When he gets pushed to the moon again, he'll be hated in two weeks, within two weeks. We'll have to wait till Monday Night Raw, and that's all I can say about that. Triple H on the DX induction into the Hall of Fame. Triple H spoke with ESPN's Tim Ferovati, Fir- I can't even say that name. On the announcement that DX will be inducted into this year's Hall of Fame. Triple H spoke about having both versions of the group, the original group with himself, Shawn Michaels, and China, which, where is Ravishing Rick Rude in this? By the way, he was in the original version. That's the one thing. Everyone's like complaining about China not getting her own induction, but she's getting in. Where the fuck is Ravishing Rick Rude? Where is Rick Rude? He, I know he's already in on his own, but he was. Just as much as a part of the formation of DX than Shawn Michaels, Triple H, in China. And later, Road Dog, Billy Gunn, X Pac being inducted and cited both how both iterations made their mark. I think it's the most meaningful for us all to go in together and to be recognized together because I think both groups were just as impactful. Triple H spoke about the group got off the ground, saying it was unlike one anyone in wrestling had seen before and the timing was key. He said, and I quote, it's funny thing because DX was something that before Nash and Hall left, at the time we were all talking about using the click as it was, kind of morphing that into television since it was out there, it was so out there anyways, but things worked out the way they did, they left and the timing was right. Sean and I still wanted to do it, Vince saw the value in it, I guess if I let us go out at, go at, go at it. But at that point in time, I was looking for, uh, for a heater and we brought in China. It was completely different, no one had ever had a female enforcement before, especially one like that. It just worked out that the timing was right. When asked about China's inclusion in the Hall of Fame announcement, Triple H referenced some of his past comments about China's lifestyle choices and said that she definitely is deserving of the honor. Listen to this. Look, people believe what they want to believe. When I said a few years ago on the Austin podcast, there was complexities about it, but absolutely definitely deserves to be in there. I'd be tough to pick a female that was more impactful on the business. She did something that was completely so out there on left field that it wasn't even being considered when we first brought it up for her to come in. It wasn't even a consideration. It was just an easy thing. And against all odds, she did all of that. She earned everybody's trust. She won over the fans and she won over the boys. She did it all. From that standpoint, absolutely 100% deserves to be in the Hall of Fame and should probably be more than once as a group, but individually as well. There's more complexity than that meets the eye, but here or where I'm just happy that it's here. I'm happy for her family, the people that she was close to, that hopefully this is super meaningful to them. And I do, I know it would, I would be, it would be to her. It was a great thing, very deserving. 
When we go back to him saying, look, people believe what they want to believe. When I said a few years ago on Austin's podcast or show or whatever you want to call it, there's complexities. No, what you're saying right now is, yeah, what I said back then was fucked up. What I said back then was wrong. So I got to backtrack a little bit because if China wasn't going in with DX, all hell would break loose. People would be boycotting this thing. We want to try and sell as many tickets as we can. And oh, by the way, we want to see people stay in the Hall of Fame because as you saw last year, when Goldberg was the headliner and he was giving his speech, people were leaving the Hall of Fame. No one's going to be leaving when DX is off there. But him saying, well, look, what I said back then, there was complexities to it. No, what you said back then was a corporate answer and something that you should not have said whatsoever. All you, need, all you should have said on Austin's podcast was like, um, yeah, she's not in now. We'll try and we'll and just try to say something to try and save face. What you said back then was wrong. What you said back then you didn't need to say, and that's that. The fact that he wanted to sit there and be like, oh well, yeah, what I said a couple of years ago, it there's complexity to it. Bullshit, absolute fucking bullshit. And you know what, Triple H, you didn't want to put her in because of her lifestyle choices, and that was that. And yet, you have Sonny in the Hall of Fame, who has been caught on camera doing porn with her Hall of Fame ring on. Yeah. Yes. Sonny, Tammy Cinch has done porn, and you see her getting, like, doing whatever with her Hall of, WWE Hall of Fame ring on her finger. So, that right there just tells you that WWE is hypocritical. And it took fan backlash, and it took outrage, and I guarantee you if they would have did DX with only the five live members, no Rick Rue, which where the fuck is he at, and no China, I guarantee you people would have fucking lost their cool. But again, congratulations to D-Generation X. I don't think Road Dog, Billy Gunn, or x Pack would have been put in by themselves. I'm just going to say it right now. And honestly... Triple H, I'm surprised they had him. I'm surprised they did the DX induction so early on. I figured Triple H would have been in, and then they would have did DX a couple years later, but more of its own. Matt Hardy gets us an update on when his contract ends. Last August, Matt Hardy's wife, Bobby Hardy, appeared on Busted Open and spoke about her husband, who was going through a transitional period at the time, where he was stepping away from the ring to rehabilitate his back and hip. She also noted that his contract would be up in March of this year. She said, and I quote, Matt is good. Matt is right now going through a bit of a transitional period. Matt Hardy, uh, Hardy said he's not really sure what he's going to be doing. His contract is up in March, which I'm sure not, not sure many people are aware of. But there's sort of a decision to be made at this point as to whether or not he should continue his in-ring career or if he should pursue something different, which he would totally be up for and was excited to do, I feel. Earlier this week, Matt Hardy tweeted out a photo from 2014 when he held two titles and two different indie promotions and wrote how he felt comfortable working outside of WWE. Hardy would respond to an individual who said that will probably be a tweet he'll be forced to delete. The WWE stupid star replied in the quote, well, it was quite the opposite and noted that he had 11 days left on his WWE contract. <clears throat> he said, not a threat at all, just a fact. I have 11 days left on my current deal. I love WWE, but I am 100% comfortable being outside the walls of pro wrestling's Alexandria. Safe zone. I'm born, I'm born a survivalist. My previous, previous team will nev never face deletion. Last month, Hardy noted that he physically greenlit to return to the ring. Matt Hardy will be gone from WWE in a, in, in a few days. Matt Hardy will probably not at least time with this contract. So, let's see. I, superstars that could be gone by the time WrestleMania is over. Matt Hardy, Jeff Hardy, Dean Ambrose, AJ Styles, Shinsuke Nakamura, Jimmy and Jay of the Usos. That's seven guys right there that could be gone after WrestleMania. By the time WrestleMania is over, that could be everything. Like, oh yeah. And there's another one we're going to talk about in a second. But that's seven guys right there. Do all seven of these guys gone? No. I, AJ Styles is probably going nowhere. AJ Styles is only going to stay. They might get the Usos because they just put the tag team titles on them, but the Usos could ask for the release. You just never know. Um, Dean Ambrose is gone. We already know that. Dean Ambrose, you can tell, is gone. He's already he's already back to being a babyface, I guess, on Monday Night Raw. He slapped the shit taste out of Drew McIntyre, and they tried to be buddy-buddy with Seth Rollins again, which made absolutely no fucking sense. So WWE... Could be mi missing a good portion of the core. Jeff Hardy, 
I'm sure has the same amount of time left in his contract. Maybe he signed his own contract differently. You never know. He could have a longer deal already. Who knows? But that's seven guys right there who could be gone by the end of WrestleMania. And three of them could be gone in March because I guess Nakamura's contract's up in March. Matt and Jess are probably up at the same time. We'll have to wait and see. And if broken Matt Hardy is all elite, all elite, we'll know why. Speaking of releases, Ty Dillinger requests his release. WWE's Ty Dillinger is the latest to, um, latest talent to request the release. He revealed this on his official Twitter account as to set things straight before any rumors start to spread. This evening, I'm requesting my release from WWE. In the past five and a half years with them, I have seen and done some wonderful things, things that I am very proud of and will never forget. I have met and worked with unquestionably some of the greatest talents on earth and pleasure that has been all mine. He went on to explain his reasoning for the release. I feel at this time, this this decision, as extremely difficult as it was, is for what is best for myself and WWE. I wish to continue to grow as a performer and offer those paying hard earned money to go watch a show. I am performing on a little more of myself. Dillinger then explained that he has respect for his employees to male and female locker rooms, coaches, and producers, and production ring crew, all the way up to the very top of the WWE and most of all the fans. I wish you all the very best and thank you for the bottom of my heart for everything. Now, this does not mean Ty Dillinger is going to have a re- is going to get his release. I saw that tweet. I saw like Nikki Cross, um, Xavier Woods, referees, personnel in the back. Everybody under the sun was thanking him for his time in WWE. WWE Vince McMahon is not going to let anybody go that they cannot let go that who they can keep. Ty Dillinger asked for his release does not mean he's getting his release. People are expecting Ty Dillinger to have his release and be good and everything. I don't think WWE is going to do that. Why would they do that? Why would WWE give his release, but they wouldn't give the Revival their release? It's, it's, it ha- and hasn't come out now. It could all come out that <clears throat> tomorrow, I, or today, when I, after I upload this, this video goes up, Ty Dillinger has got re- release was granted. I could be totally wrong, but as far as I know, that's not happening. When was the last time, like, the last, last year, three people got released. Eric Arden, Enzo Mori, Rich Swan, and Big Cass were the only three people let go in WWE all year. This year, Hideo Itami, who's going back to Japan to wrestle in pro wrestling Noah or whatever else. So, WWE is not going to let Ty Dillinger go. We might start seeing the Perfect 10 on SmackDown Live a lot more. But as far as I know, and as far as I, I feel, they're not going to let him go. Why the fuck would they let him go to succeed in All Elite Wrestling or Ring of Honor or New Japan or Defiant Wrestling or Impact Wrestling or anywhere else? Why would they let him go when they could keep him there under contract for however long he has left? We'll have to wait and see, but as far as I'm concerned, I don't see him being let go. Why would they let Ty Dillinger go if they're not going to let the Revival go? Plain and simple. Why would they let him go if they're not going to let Mike Kanellis go? Tell me that right now. What makes Ty Dillinger much different? Kenta is different because he was just... he. They probably expect him to go back to Japan where he probably wanted to go. And that's probably where he went. But all these other guys, you're not going to see the Revival get the release or Ty Dillinger get his release. The only way you're getting out of WWE is you're not signing a new contract and your, con- your contract's up. That is like the only way you're getting out. The Usos, unless they sign a new contract, could be out of here right after Mania. Dean Ambrose is gone. Then uh, Matt Hardy could be gone. Um, let me see what else here. Shinsuke Nakamura supposedly could be gone. AJ Styles' contract's up in April as well. There are so many people coming up in April. Ty Dillinger wants to leave WWE. He'll probably have to wait till his contract's out. Plain and simple. News on the women's division coming out of WrestleMania. The main event would see Raw this past Monday's Raw saw Ronda Rousey successfully defend the title against the leader of the Rat Squad, Ruby Wright, again. On the Wrestling Observer Radio, Dave Meltzer revealed that a lot of the details surrounding the Rousey vs. Ruby vs. Riot title match on Raw were put into place at the very last minute. Gee, a last minute change on Monday Night Raw? Where have we heard that before? In fact, earlier that day, the match was instead scheduled as Alexa Bliss vs. Ronda Rousey in a non title squash match with Ronda coming out on top. The change, along with the NXT call-ups being brought to Raw last minute, or the result of the script from the show, was reportedly not being ready until 30 minutes after they had gone on the air. People, 
we this is this is not news. This is just how WWE does this. We all like scripts change until it comes on the WWE's TV. Something could be saying that's going to happen. Like Ric Flair's birthday bash could be going on, but like thirty minutes before the show, it could be canceled because Ric Flair got sick or because WWE wanted to go in a different direction. It's just how it is. WWE was apparently even making small changes in the program in the second hour of the show. It also states that WWE needed to utilize more time with the Rousey match, so the decision was to get to made to pit Rousey against Riot in a rematch from the Elimination Chamber. The two were comfortable working with one another. Really? You gave him an hour, a minute, and 40 seconds at the pay-per-view. And Rousey was glad to give Riot some time where she could really show her talent in the ring. Rousey is said to be a team player within the company. Her goal is similar to the impact she made in the women's MMA or to come in the WWE, contribute to the genre, and then elevate it, and then continue on. That is the only reason Ronda Rousey is here, if anyone doesn't realize it. She's here to contribute to the women's division and elevate it. And since Ronda Rousey has been in the, in the women's division, Becky Lynch has seen her rise, Charlotte Flair has been where she is, Oscar's women's champion has been elevated somewhat. The young women's division is in a much better place with since Ronda Rousey's been here. Whenever, whenever Rousey does actually lead the company, it is 100% her decision and there is no set date that has been determined. Apparently, once Rousey has moved on from the WWE, the word backstage is that Charlotte Flair, Becky Lynch, and WWE's newcomer Lacey Evans will be the push as the big three women superstars. As we had reported earlier this week, Lacey Evans is said to be online for a major push for WWE management. People in charge are said to hire on Evans because of her background as a Marine and status as a mother. Now, the one thing I have to say about this is why is it only a big three? You're gonna have you need two women for Raw and two women for SmackDown to push up so you have the big you should have a big four. Two for Raw, two for SmackDown. Sheldon and Lacey Evans will probably be for SmackDown. Becky Lynch, unless you're going to bring Smack, you're probably going to be Charlotte Flair to Raw. Bring Charlotte Flair to Raw. So Charlotte and Becky would be on Raw. Lacey Evans, and I would say Oscar as well, would be your big four. So what it's going to be is like Charlotte and Becky are number one and two, Lacey Evans is three, and, and Oscar would probably be four. Or you'll have an interchanging four. You get ha if you want to have four, if you want to have a big push for the women's division, you need to have four women instead of just three. Because unless you're going to merge the divisions 100%, which I don't think is going to happen, you need to have one, two for each show to be your big, put your big main stars. We have what could be a retirement match at WrestleMania. Recently teased in the ring retirement for Hall of Famer Kurt Angle on Raw, and that was apparently done as it for a major reason we, as we get close to WrestleMania 35. There has been talk within WWE of Angle doing a retirement match soon, according to Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Reserve Radio. That, retirement ma uh, sorry. that retirement match could be at WrestleMania 35 in April. There's no word yet on who Angle might wrestle for his retirement match, but he will likely work the WrestleMania 35 card, even if they side against the retirement match stipulation. Meltzer noted that Angle has definitely been in recent talks to wrestle a match on the biggest show of the year. Angle has worked a number of multi-man shows, in single matches since returning to the ring and EC at the WWE 2017 TLC pay-per-view where he teamed with Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose to defeat The Bar, Kane, The Miz, and Braun Strowman in a handicap match, TLC match that night, which Swan saw Angle, um, saw Braun Strowman turn babyface 100%, and two is when Dean Ambrose got his injury that led him to his time off. Angle then worked the 2017 Survivor Series pay-per-view in a 5-on-5 match before teaming with Raw Women's Champion Ronda Rousey for the big WrestleMania 34 win over Triple H and Stephanie McMahon in the match of the night in 2018's WrestleMania. Angle has worked a few multi-man matches since then, but has also had three TV singles losses, Dolph Ziggler at Crown Jewel in November, Drew McIntyre on November 5th, and then Baron Corbin on January 28th of this year. Angle's most recent matches, including teaming with Strowman for a loss to McIntyre and Corbin on February 4th, Raw, did team with Strowman and WWE Intercontinental Champion Finn Balor for a win over Corbin, McIntyre, and Bobby Lashley on the February 11th edition of Raw. I really don't care. Angle have his retirement match, whatever. Have him retire, do what you want. Angle versus whoever is just a slot for Angle working WrestleMania is just a slot that somebody else should have. That is all the WWE news before we get to AEW news, a little Lucha Underground news, because a Lucha Underground executive vice, uh, executive producer for Lee's show, the show is dead. 
Earlier this week, co-executive producer Chris DeJoseph gave his thoughts on the status of Lucha Underground Season 5 in a conversation with Twitter. DeJoseph was asked about the future of the show, and he responded, Personally, I think it's Ned, but I hope not. A fan commented how amazing the shows were to attend, and DeJoseph reported, Well, at this point, it's on, it's, it's on the producers if you want to demand it. Season 4 of the show wrapped up last November. News on the se- next season has been non-existent, while the official decision remains to be made. Some wrestlers are still being held with, to their contracts with the promotion. Earlier this month, King Quino filed documents in Los Angeles against the LRA Network and Lucha Underground's production, Baba G Productions, claiming the contract illegally restricted wrestlers from finding work in wrestling and is in the violation of California law. Meanwhile, in a now deleted tweet, Eva Lee said last month that she was being held hostage by her contract with Lucha Underground. She tweeted, For a bit of one and a half years now, I've been battling Lucha Underground to grant me my release. Eva Lee wrote, they convinced me to do season four under the promise that I'd be released after the season concluded and was still unhappy. They can currently are still refusing to do so despite having been told numerous times that they would. Shortly after her comments, Joey Riley supported Eva Lease. He said, I back Eva Lease 100% on this. Ryan wrote, prior to at season four, we were told anybody who requested a release would be granted one. Some didn't left after the tapings. Others showed faith in the product and not seen it. Seems are being punished for it. With uh, no season five in sight, it's petty to keep anyone locked up. Quite honestly, for me, I think Lucha Underground is dead and buried. If it comes back, it comes back. But I have not really seen a Lucha Underground. But to anybody wondering what's going on with season five, there is your answer. Why did Kota Ibushi and choose New Japan over All Elite Wrestling? Earlier this month that New Japan is a new beginning in Osaka, Japan, Kota Ibushi announced he would be staying exclusively with the promotion until 2021. Although he prepared regularly for New Japan over the last couple of years, Ibushi was still much a freelance wrestler until now. Ibushi will, also particip- will, will be also be participating in this year's New Japan Cup starting on March 8th with the winner getting an IWGP Heavyweight Championship match against Jay White at Ring of Honor New Japan G1 Supercard on April 6th at Madison Square Garden. In regards to his contract, AEW had obviously interest in Japan, the Japanese superstar, but in the interview with Shupo, the translated by New Japan announcer Chris Collinson, Abushi spoke about the facts that kept him out of AEW. He said, and I quote, The second I went, that would be the end of my wrestling career, I thought Abushi began. What I realized talking to AEW was, I really don't care about money. AEW said they would just want me to in their ring in some form. The ideal for them was for me to move to America and be there full time. I turned them down just after Wrestle Kingdom. If I went there, it would be the end of my career. There wouldn't be anywhere else to go after that. No step up. Nothing left to do. There would be the last step to make. And after that, things would just go down. Great money, but I want to keep developing. Getting back to New Japan, Ibushi noted he still feels the best place to change the world in, in New Japan where he top three desired opponents, Jay White, Kazuchi Okada, and Shin, Shin, Shingao. Tagaki reside. I'm sorry if I messed his name up. Ibushi also said New Japan would be where he ends his wrestling career. Kenny Kumega wants to change the world with wrestling. I think that change the world with wrestling, New Japan is the best place to do that. Ibushi said that there's there's where he and I differ. I can do all that here. All the places I've been, New Japan is the highest level. I really wanted to lay my cards out and shut down the what about. Abushi talk uh, soccer was that chance the Abushi Institute is on hold. I'm exclusive to New Japan. This is the last decision I will make in my career. I'll end my wrestling career in New Japan. So, there you go. Anybody wondering why New Japan? Well, there you go. Quite honestly, I think Kota Abushi will be sticking to New Japan. I know him and Kenny Omega are like super close friends and everything. And here's the thing. He might be finishing his career in New Japan. But if New Japan and all the wrestling ever strike a deal, that doesn't mean we won't see Kota Ibushi wrestle in all of wrestling, just not right now. If uh, Because the G1 Supercard is the last date, I believe, for the contract between Ring of Honor and New Japan. So, if New Japan Pro Wrestling and all of wrestling start like come together for a deal... Then we could definitely see Kota Ibushi, like we could definitely see the Golden Lovers against the Young Bucks or against the Lucha Bros in All Elite Wrestling, and also see Kenny Omega back in New Japan, where he actually wants to be too. Only time will tell, and we'll keep you posted on if anything comes between New Japan and All Elite Wrestling as the months come on. On to the AEW news: Billy Gunn on how Goldberg and Batista could fit in All Elite Wrestling. 
<clears throat> With decades of experience in the ring, performer, and backstage agent, Billy Gunn was brought into all of the wrestling to serve as a producer, but could other but could other big name former WWE stars also be joining him in AEW? Batista, no, he's not coming in, he already said so. There's been rumors that the likes of Goldberg and Batista could pop up in AEW, and Gunn responded with that the speculation that when he joined the um the when the when CLI podcast, which took place before the, the, the announcement that the DFs were going into the 2019 Hall of Fame. He said, name recognition and what they could bring to the company. Yes, Gunn replied when asked if he saw a place in AEW for those guys. Do I feel we need to focus them on them and mixing them with their talent? No. Yes, the biggest thing that Bill Goldberg and Dave Batista could bring to any promotion if they ever go anywhere but e, um, WWE would be name recognition. Would we need? Would you need them? No. Could they help with name recognition? Yes. If you, they could help land a TV deal. That's hey, you could go in and you'd be like, hey, we have Dave Batista. You know, one of the stars of the Guardians of the Galaxy. He's been in Avengers. We have him not all the time, but we will have him for like one or two dates a month. Goldberg, we're gonna have one or two dates a month. Boom, big TV deal right there. Gunn then compared what he could do with the new age, what they what they could do that the New Age Outlaws did in their final run by helping to get over new talents with the tag division. Gunn said the Usos were stuck until the Outlaws put them over in the same sin, ironically, Cody and Goldust. Yes, they had all the talent and just needed a little shove, stated Gunn. I'm not saying that we made them, but we helped them. I would think that would be the same for Goldberg and Batista if they were coming. I have no idea. I feel that we would need to know that if they could, if they could, if they come here, you are here to help with our talent and not get yourself over. We're still a couple of months away from AEW's first official show, and Gunn says the entire company is putting their efforts towards double or nothing. We're just focused on double or nothing and working our way towards that, said Gunn. It's a startup company. We're brand new. It's a great time for wrestling fans and for us as a company. We got some t- some great things, some great some new things coming. It's going to be exciting, and it's going to be an alternative to WWE programming. I wish I could tell you a whole lot of stuff that was going on, but unfortunately, I don't even know that. It's coming along slowly, but it's coming along very good. Gunn's youngest son, Austin, is also a professional wrestler and will be part of the Over the Budget Battle Royal at All Who was part of the Over the Budget Battle Royal at All In. Gunn discussed that there was a talk of Austin joining AEW. He's not coming to AEW, Gunnfield. He has some other stuff that he wants to do on his own. He has some stuff in the works. I don't think I'm allowed to say it just yet, but he's got some great stuff in the mix and it's super exciting. He's going to be a huge star. I love coaching him. He's got some great things coming up. So AEW recently announced that they will have a partnership with AAA in Mexico City and going to explain why this is all beneficial to the talent. <clears throat> I think it's a good thing that we get that into we get to intermingle some talent instead of gun. There won't be a lot of discrepancies when discrepancies when they come and work, and we won't have to jump through hoops. I think it's a good because AAA has some great talent. I think that they would be good platform for some of the youngest talents to have that haven't had opportunities to go outside the U.S. I think it only makes more us be better when you can work other talent and some other store styles. It's an awesome thing that we can use some of the talents. They can use some others. We can intermingle and bring them all together to make some awesome talents. So that was a lot to take in there. One second. Yeah. When it comes to Goldberg and Batista, one, Batista's not coming. He already has been stated that he has no plans of signing with AEW. Even though he did help speculation when he took a picture with Chris Jericho, even though they're friends and they're longtime buddies. But, yes, if some if a star like a Goldberg or a Batista come to AEW, they bring the name recognition. They bring the star power. Chris Jericho, the re- one of the biggest reasons Chris Jericho is in AEW is, is because he has the star power that a guy like Sonny Kiss or Jungle Boy or um, Hangman Page does not have. I believe it was Booker T who said it is that, or some, I think it was Booker T who said it that Chris Jericho has the star power of a, um, like an Ozzy Osbourne or one of those rock stars that when they walk in the room, you're like, that's Chris Jericho. I want to get an autograph with that guy. Um, like Hangman Page could walk into a room and nobody and half the room doesn't even know who he is. Chris Jericho walks in that room, everybody knows who he is. That's what makes his inclusion in AEW so much better. Chris Jericho being in AEW, it's like, okay, we got something here. 
it legitimizes AEW a lot more. Like when Hulk Hogan went to WCW, and Gene Oakland went to WCW, and Macho Man went to WCW, that legitimized WCW as competition to WWF at the time. I'm not saying that they're on the Chris Jericho's on the same plane as Hogan and Gene Oakland, but in this day and age, he is that for AEW. He gives them legitimacy. He gives them the star power that they need. Dean Ambrose coming into AEW, if he does, as John Moxley, I don't think would be as much because he would not be able to beat Dean Ambrose. So a lot of people is like, everyone would know him as Dean Ambrose, but he would have to be called John Moxley or something else. Maybe they can go with John Ambrose. There you go. Don't go back to John Moxley. Just take your first name and take the Ambrose name and call yourself John Ambrose. I'm just throwing things out there, okay? What were the plans pitched for the Young Bucks? Coming into WWE, had it happened? WWE reportedly had big storyline plans for the Young Bucks to invade the promotion during their recent contract talks. It was noted by Dave Meltzer on the latest edition of Wrestling is Overrated that WWE had a, WWE had a full storyline pitch to the Young Bucks with the contract offers that were made before the brothers decided on signing with All Elite Wrestling. The story would, ha, would have seen the Young Bucks lead an invasion angle for WrestleMania 35 season, presumably involving the Young Bucks, Cody Rhodes, Kenny Omega, and Hangman Page. Meltzer did not confirm that those other talents would have been involved with the invasion, just that the invasion angle was pitched to the Young Bucks. As we noted, the Bucks, Cody Page, and Omega all turned down WWE offers in order to be part of AEW with Tony Khan. The Wrestling Observer Newsletter has previously reported that Triple H worked hard on the potential signings and offered to a unique deals in hopes of signing all of them. Page's deals were reportedly to work the WWE NXT brand for main roster money, putting him as one of the top stars of the brand. WWE reportedly offered a three-year deal for the Bucks, which would have seen them sign for the same amount of money that AJ Styles is in its making. The deal, would have, the deal from WWE would have also had a network spot for the weekly being the Elite Series. The deal also included a six-month window that would have allowed them to get out of their contracts if they were unhappy. There's no word yet on exactly what the WWE offered Omega, but word was that they made a fantastic offer to him. The Bucks spoke with Chuck Carroll of CBS Sports earlier this year and talked about how aggressively the offer was from WWE. They said, yeah, we could say that the offer for us was very aggressive. If the, the WWE offer was a little bit more difficult to walk away from. Matt Jackson added, I'll tell you this. For a moment, I thought that we would probably be going to WWE. That was the closest that I've ever come to us going there, for sure. And they were, they were great. They were very respectful, and they told us what our value was. I think I was really like, wake up call for us. It was almost like, wow. It's good to be wanted. These guys, they're teaching us we are, we are valuable and we're worth this much. It was definitely something we, we were considering and it was hard to turn down because it would be just, it would be life changing. Exactly. Yes, it would be. WWE tried everything to sign Cody, sign Adam, um, the Hangman Page, the Young Bucks, and Kenny Omega. The biggest reason why they did not sign with them is honestly, did you see Monday Night Raw? Did you see what WWE does did with the NXT superstars? Did you, if you listen to what I talked about at the beginning of this show, that is why else? Why the fuck would you want to sign with WWE? Why would you want to come in to have be brought in to a place which, of course, the Young Bucks, I'm pretty sure, would have been getting pops anyway. But WWE would have brought them into one of the deadest towns in all of the in all of the United States to get no reaction and. Everything that they bought, they they worked for would have been dead. Being the elite on the WWE Network, I've already said this. Yes, it would be a great value. They'd be able to have WWE production values. But then comes the problem of going out there and trying to make WWE's version of being the elite. Being the elite would not feel the same. People would t- people would probably be like, "Oh, you sold out. This doesn't feel the same. How could you have being the elite on the network? It doesn't feel the same because WWE stifles what they want them to do." Everything that you see them doing on being the elite would be, there wouldn't be half of that stuff. They wouldn't be allowed to show superstars who are not in the WWE. You wouldn't see, like, indie, they wouldn't be able to go to indie events and take that stuff. None of that. Being the elite would not be what it is. It would not, it would probably not be as popular as it is on YouTube, plain and simple. Let's see here. Yeah, we had two more here. 
AEW's trademarks were actually refused. An application for the trademark All Elite Wrestling has been initially refused. According to PW Insider, AEW filed for the trademark but was refused because the company needs to modify its identification of goods and services. AEW also needs to pay the proper fee and claim that the company is not claiming exclusive rights to the use of the word wrestling. Along, also, along with the trademark All Elite Wrestling, the AEW logo, the phrase Change the World has also been refused with trademarks for the same reason mentioned above. One other factor is due to pending application for the phrase All Out, which could have an impact on AEW's application. This is something that happens when you, like, th this is just paperwork needs to be filled out, fees need to be paid. When everything's all said and done, AEW will have their, will have their, um, will have their, um, trademarks, everything done and everything by the time Double or Nothing happens, plain and simple. Speaking of Double or Nothing, a new match has been announced on the latest episode of All Elite Wrestling's Road to Double or Nothing. It was announced by Cody Rhodes that the Over the Budget Battle Royal will be returning for AEW's Double or Nothing event on May 25th from Las Vegas. The first Over the Budget Battle Royal took place at All In in 2018 and was won by Flip Gordon, who Cody noted that they have a special incentive for the winner of the Battle Royal at Double or Nothing, but he cannot reveal that incentive just yet. Um, the original Double or Nothing, the original Over the Budget Battle Royal winner got a shot at the Ring of Honor Championship. I don't know what the incentive is going to be this time, but maybe it could be a future title shot. I'm not sure. AEW has confirmed that the following participants for the Battle Royal are Brandon Cutler, Kip Sabin, and Sonny Kiss, who we did see at the ticket party last a couple weeks ago. Double Nothing, of course, takes place on May 25th at the MGM Grand Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada, and this is what the updated card looks like. Kenny Omega vs. Chris Jericho, Pac vs. Hangman to Adam Page, Cody Rhodes vs. a mystery opponent. Dr. Britt Baker vs. Kylie Ray vs. Nyla Rose. Team AEW, uh, um, I don't know why they keep putting that in there. It's SoCal Uncensored vs. Team Oriental Wrestling, which is Christopher Daniels, Becky Zarian, and Scorpio Sky vs. Chima and two partners of his own. Over the budget, Battle Royale, Kip Saban, Sonny Kiss, and Brandon Cutler, others to be announced. Yet to be confirmed, the Young Bucks vs. Pentagon and Ray Phoenix, and appearances by Brandy Rose, and the uh, Triple H World Cruiserweight Champion, Sammy Gravea, who should have a match in my opinion. The Best Friends, Beretta and Chuck Taylor, and others. MJF, Sammy Gravea, and the Best Friends are all probably going to be in the other ba budget battle royal. That's just my opinion. Double or Nothing is looking to be a really great show. The Over the Budget Battle Royal, and Cody Rhodes said it in that too, was absolutely one of the best matches on All In completely. You could put it up there with majority of the matches that happened during that week, during that show. Outside of the Matt Cross, I think MJF match, which was just trash, but definitely was one of the best matches on the show. It was actually one of the best Battle Royals I have seen in a very long time. So definitely... Something to look forward to, and it's going to be fun to watch that match when it happens. The, the only thing I can think of an incentive is is that the winner of the Over the Budget Battle Royal is going to get a shot at the AEW Championship or a the AEW Midcard Championship, whatever that secondary title is going to be, or something like that. I don't see another reason, like any other type of incentive they could have, but we will find out in due time the AEW over the budget battle royal incentive will be but it's definitely like AEW's double or nothing is looking to be a great show but to anybody and I'll say it again to anybody who thinks that AEW is not breathing down Vince McMahon's neck it, Vince McMahon's neck if you think AEW is just a glorified t-shirt company which in the all elite the being the elite episode where Kenny like Kenny Omega um, was signing where they were doing the whole bit where he was signing his contract and everything they did an over dramatic thing where he's like, you guys are just a glorified t-shirt company. You don't have a match card together and everything. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's them taking shots at the fans who want to say they're a glorified t-shirt company. They, they, are, they are gaining so much momentum that Vince McMahon is trying to think out of the box to get his ratings up. To people who think ratings don't matter, look at Monday Night Raw. Look at SmackDown Live. The best ratings of the year for SmackDown. The best ratings since November. Raw, the best ratings since, uh, since September. And you still think ratings don't matter. They do. They're going to matter. In the grand scheme of things, the ratings are going to fucking matter. 
October is coming very soon. SmackDown's ratings must get up. Which says when we get to when we get to October fourth, I believe. October fourth, I believe it's October fourth. When we get to that October, if they don't have ratings that are satisfactory to the to what do you want to say? It's October 9th, yeah, October 9th. October 9th. If the ratings are not to Fox's satisfactory, and plus, trust me, 2.739 or whatever it is, is not going to be Fox satisfactory to Fox. SmackDown Live will be canceled in no time, and the Fox deal will be over in no time. WWE's got to get their shit together. Because if they don't, they're going to be suffering pretty badly. But that is your unscripted for episode 58. We'll be here Monday for Monday night. Well, we'll be here either Monday night or Tuesday morning for Monday night. Well, I don't think I know how my situation is going to be. But make sure to hit that subscribe button. Comment down below. Like or dislike this video. Let me know what you think of everything we went over this week. Thank you to everybody who watched Monday Night Raw, SmackDown Live, or NXT reviews. If you watched the Elimination Chamber predictions and review or episode 57 of Unscripted, Thank you guys all. I cannot do this guys without you. Thank you. And I will see you guys Monday for Monday Night Raw. Or we'll see you Tuesday afternoon at noon. Where I have a feeling Miss Becky Lynch is going to be putting Ric Flair in the disarm her. And that is the way this needs to go. We'll talk about that on the Monday Night Raw review. Until then, my name is Afraz and you guys have a good one.